And so just about 30 hours after the Purdue men punched their ticket to the Final Four, the Iowa women do the exact same. First time since 2015 when the Maryland women went, Wisconsin and Michigan State had two Big Ten men's teams in the Final Four. You see, this is only the sixth time in history that it has happened, dating back to the first time in 1993. Let's start with Caitlin Clark, and I know everybody wants to talk about the 41 because they're really impressive. Haley Van Lith afterwards said there were a couple of threes that she made where all I could do was shake my head because I was right That's there. That's all I could do, too. And she's shooting it from 28 <laughs> feet away. But the 12 assists as well, and Shimmy, it was a little shaky early, four early turnovers, a couple of questionable passes, and then Caitlin settled, the rest of this team settled, and that offensive flow is just so much fun to watch. And I'm glad you brought up the assists because that's what I want to talk about too because you can try to uh, take away her scoring. Very few have, but you can try to take away her scoring, and then that's where her teammates step up. This is one of the first games, however, where she scored over 40 points and had double digits and assists. So she really, she was on another level last night. Uh, her, her three points were falling. And I knew it was going to be a long night for LSU. First two possessions, Rick, they go under the ball screen. Like, that's just Kate Clark, Clark one, Caitlin Clark 101. Don't go under the ball screen. They did. So now I'm like, okay, she's got it going. She's feeling it from, you know, offense from the three. Well, then they let her get in the paint. You can't do both. So you either want to try to give up the three, uh, but then keep her out of the, keep her out of the paint, or take away her three and then let her get in the paint. Well, LSU let her do both. And when she gets in the paint, that's when she's the defense collapses and she's able to start seeking her teammates. 12 assists. So that's how I know that, that Iowa, when they're playing at their best, it's not just the fact that they had three players in double digits, but Caitlin Clark had 12 assists. So that means she was finding her teammates and they were hitting shots. Yeah, and most of those assists went to either Sita Falter or Kate Martin, who combined to go for 37 points and 11 rebounds. Now, Kate Martin was a known commodity coming into this year. The growth of Sydney Falter, I think, make this Iowa team really dangerous because now Hannah Stolke doesn't have to have a big game. Gabby Marshall can basically just focus on defense and the occasional three-pointer. If Sydney Falter is playing like this in the Final Four, I know it's hard to say that Iowa can be a favorite if they match up against South Carolina in the championship game because the Gamecocks are unbeaten, but I don't think they can be considered an underdog against anybody. Well, they're balanced. They're incredibly balanced now, and we've seen glimpses of this as the season has gone on. I think what this is what my personal philosophy is. They had confidence. They had a lot of great wins early in the season, and it gave the other players confidence. It gave Caitlin Clark confidence in her teammates so that they could kind of continue to grow. And that's exactly what we've seen. Sydney Falter, from December on, she's been a completely different player. And then she's taken it up another level in March. If Caitlin Clark doesn't get most outstanding player in the Big Ten tournament, that award goes to Sydney Falter because of the way that she's played. But what I'm also seeing with Iowa is that they're winning in different ways. Like I've said, well, can Iowa win if Caitlin Clark doesn't have 40 points? Well, they've answered that. Yes, they can. We've seen in the Big Ten tournament, Iowa has struggled. Uh, Caitlin Clark struggled initially to score. Her other teammates stepped up. There was a game where they had five in double digits. There was a game where they won with their defense and points off turnovers. We saw a little bit of that last night, too. There was a game where their post players stepped up. So what we're seeing now is this balance. And yes, I was one of those players in the beginning of the year that didn't know if Iowa could pull it off because of what they lost. It wasn't a disrespect to Iowa. It was, I just had so much respect for Monica Sonano. And, and so what, we're, what they're showing is that we can win Iowa, we can win in different ways. And that's what they're gonna need against South Carolina. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, Gino, uh, Wes Moore at North Carolina State and Dawn Staley, they're going to have a much better defensive game plan than what we saw from LSU last Obviously, night. Obviously, before they get to South Carolina, assuming South Carolina beats NC State, Iowa has to take care of UConn, and the Huskies were phenomenal as well on Monday night. Paige Beckers, their star. It's such an interesting comparison. We look at the careers of Kaitlin Clark and Paige Beckers as you peek at the bracket, which starts Friday night in Cleveland. They started at the same time. Kaylin said the one school she was not recruited by, which hurt her, was UConn. And Gina Oriyama, the legendary UConn coach, has since said, yeah, I made a mistake, but I also got Paige Beckers that same year. And she's been phenomenal. Of course, Paige had to suffer through not one, but two major injuries. Now trying to get back to a Final Four for the second time, or does get back to a Final Four 
for the second time in her career. This is a little bit more of a star versus star matchup because Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, I know there was so much talk about the animosity and the hand in the face and the ring. They don't play the same position. They don't play the same style. Caitlin and Paige is almost more of a player versus player showdown than we'll see on they Friday. They both have the ball in their hands. They both control the flow of the offense. They both are the, the captains, the quarterbacks, the point guards of their team. But with that being said, Gino, and I know I know what he said, and, and he's also kind of thrown a few digs, too, about uh, how many times a game she she shoots and Paige. But he's well, that's Gino. Player. You know, Paige Beckers is the best player in the country. But you know who doesn't get enough credit for Caitlin Clark's success, in my opinion, is Lisa Bluter. Because I don't know if Caitlin Clark is able to do the things that we have borne witness to over the last four years if she goes to any school other than, than Iowa. Lisa Bluter allowed C Caitlin Clark to be Caitlin Clark, allowed her to play her game. And that says a lot because I know a lot of coaches, I know a lot of coaches that would not. The first time she tried to pull from half court, they'd have been like, sit down right here next to me. Right, this bench. is my right. system. This is not so your team. Paige Beckers ended up at the right school playing for the right coach for her and Caitlin Clark ended up at the right school for her. Uh, UConn is really dangerous playing its best basketball. They have had to deal with a lot of you hear it all the time, right? We've had to deal with so much adversity this year. Sometimes it's true in UConn's case. It is absolutely true season ending injuries all over the place. They've had no depth for basically three or four months and yet they find themselves inside the final four. Other than Paige Beckers, what makes this UConn team dangerous? Oh, they have a, a great post player in Aaliyah Edwards. I mean, she's a dog. She's already said that she's not coming back to school, so she's going to— The top 10 WNBA a, pick. Absolutely, absolutely. She's going to be a lottery pick. Um, you know, they have— uh, uh, freshman Ashlyn Shade, you know, who's in the big, the foot of the print of the Big Ten. She's an Indiana player. Um, she's really stepped up. Another freshman, Ace, really stepped up. So they, they have, I mean, yeah, they only have seven or eight players, but they're all all Americans. Okay. So it's a little bit different than what we're used to here in the Big Ten. You've got one five star, maybe two five stars on a team, and the rest are role players. They've got seven healthy All-Americans on their roster. Yeah, Nika Mule, awesome, uh, KK Arnold. But we saw a lot of foul trouble early, and UConn is not a team that can allow itself to get into foul trouble. They found a way against USC and Juju Watkins, and that's the next coming. It's so fantastic. We're talking about Caitlin Clark moving on and Aaliyah Edwards and all these great players. We have Juju Watkins just finishing her freshman year at USC. Women's college basketball is in such a phenomenal spot, and this is – arguably the most anticipated women's Final Four in history. Again, it starts on Friday in Cleveland. We will have on-site coverage throughout the weekend right here on the Big Ten Network. Now, there were other tournaments going on involving the Big Ten on Monday night. A lot of action in both the WBIT, first year of that championship, and the WNIT. The BIT semifinals pitted Penn State against Villanova, Illinois against Washington State. Lady Lions come up short. Illinois moves on to the championship game of the WBIT. They'll face Villanova. The women's NIT was at the quarterfinal stage. Purdue's season ends with a loss to Vermont. Wisconsin comes up short against St. Louis. But Minnesota goes on the road to Laramie, beats Wyoming. And so the Gophers are now in the WNIT semifinals. Jimmy, let's start with Wisconsin. Really tough end to the season for the Badgers you lose Sarah Williams on the very first offensive possession of the game. Wisconsin hung around for a long time, but without its best player, that's a tough ask. They, lo they lose Sarah Williams, and then Sonia Copeland goes down later with a concussion is what they're calling it. And she's one of their better younger players as well. So I hate it for Marissa Mosley because she really had her team believing, playing hard down the stretch. They still finish the season with 15 wins, which is the most wins in a season in over five years. I feel like each year she's gotten a little better, a little better. And she's got youth movement. I mean, this is a very young team. They're dominated by their freshmen and their sophomores. So I hope that Sarah Williams, that her injury isn't serious and that we can see more of her greatness because I just thought she was outstanding this year. Meanwhile, their border rivals at Minnesota do pick up a road win in the WNIT quarters against a really good Wyoming team. A mile battle was terrific. And you just have to think, Mara Braun hurt again. You have to think what Coach Don Plitz the White season could have been if everybody had stayed healthy the entire year. Oh, they were going to be in the NCAA tournament. I'm telling you that right now, Rick. This was an NCAA tournament team until Mara Braun got hurt. And then Sophie Hart, their post player, got hurt. And then 
now they're playing at Wyoming in the WNIT. But again, a youth movement. We're talking about three of the youngest teams in our conference that you just mentioned in, in these other tournaments, and Purdue, Minnesota, Wisconsin. They're young. All their core players, their best players, are coming back. Future's bright for this conference. Yeah, a little bit of a step back for Katie Geralds at Purdue this year after making the NCAA tournament a season ago with that experienced roster. But let's give some love to Abby Ellis in that loss, setting the program's single season record over 200 assists this year. Abby Ellis has just, she's just been a tremendous leader. And what she's done is she's laid the foundation. Abby Ellis, over 2,000 points, over 200 assists. Janae Terry, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin Harper. Those guys, those seniors who are leaving, they've shown the young players who are coming back for Purdue of what it means to win, what it means to, uh, to wear that black and gold with honor. I'm excited for all of these young teams, but especially Purdue. All right, to the WBIT first year of this championship. And boy, Illinois has a great chance to win it all, especially if they play the way that they played in that win over Washington State. Makaira Cook and Genesis Bryant together were just unstoppable. Four fighting Illini in double digits. And then Kendall Bostic with her usual seven points, nine rebounds, outstanding night. This is the Illinois team that we all thought we were going to see back in November and December, and it's just taken them a little bit longer to get going. Makaira Cook had some health issues early in the year, so she was a little delayed. But I hope that people don't think that this was a step backwards for Shauna Green and, and her staff. She inherited a, you want to talk about dormant programs, that's what she inherited at, at Illinois. And so the fact that she goes to the NCAA tournament her first year and then her second year uh, competing for a WBIT championship, that's progress. Great coaching job. In that other BIT semifinal Penn State season comes to a close, it was not the way that we envisioned that this was a team, Shimmy, that at the end of January looked like they were poised to make it to the NCAA tournament. Wheels kind of came off late in the year. Yeah, I think it started when Tay Valade, the grad transfer, when she got hurt. She was kind of the heart and the soul of this team, Rick. She could do it on both ends of the court. And when she went out, I felt like the, the spirit of Penn State kind of went out with her. Um, you know, but McKenna Mar Marisa, uh, what a great career that she's Phenomenal had as, career. A, as a Nittany Lion. Yeah, Leilani Kapanis, uh, really a nice game and a losing effort with 18 points and 13 rebounds as the Lady Lion season does come to a close. Yeah, when you go ahead and drop 40 in the regional final, there's a very good chance you are going to be not just on the all-tournament team, but to become the region's most outstanding player. And that's exactly what Zach Eady was. Last Purdue player to do it, Carson Edwards in 2019. Prior to him, nobody had been the MOP of a regional since Joe Barry Carroll all the way back in 1980. Of course, JBC, one of Trent Meacham's all-time favorite players, as he joins us on this edition of Big Ten Today. We'll touch on Zach Eady a little bit more with Robbie Hummel coming up later in the show as well. But I want to get your thoughts on the big fella because it seems like, Trent, just when we think he's hit his ceiling, he does something to show us he's even better than we thought. Well, in, in every category that I look at, at him as a player, his conditioning, playing 39 minutes, his effectiveness around the hoop, his ability to take up space on the defensive end, his positioning, his understanding of the game. But, but Rick, I think the, the most important thing for him right now is his mental edge. He's got a chip on his shoulder. Hmm. He, he's playing with a great a, a fierceness, a, a focus that just not many players have. And you think about maybe it's his, it's his story of development. It's what happened last year. And I feel like a lot of the critics are just adding more fuel to his fire because, man, is he playing with just a, a great amount of emotion, but he's not letting it get the best of him. It's allowing him to just totally just dominate players. doesn't matter what teams are throwing against him. And so you give him a ton of credit. The team obviously plays through him so well. It's been fun to watch his growth, and it's been really fun to watch him perform so well at the most important times on the biggest stage. So you think he's being motivated? Because the criticism out there is that, listen, he's not officiated fairly. The Tennessee fans were all over social media saying, Zachy, he's bad for college basketball because we don't know how to officiate a guy like that. He spends too much time in the paint. It's not called the same on one end as it is on the other. You think he's hearing this, listening to this, and is motivated by this? I do, and I think most great competitors will, will pull whatever they can to add more motivation, to fuel them, to get them going one way or another. I mean, look, he, he's done it at such a high level all throughout the course of the season, day after day. Sometimes that can, that can wear on you. There's so much responsibility and pressure on him. Mm -hmm. And so I think you say, hey, he, I think he's welcoming it. 
and there's just a fire in his eyes. There's a fierceness that he's playing with that it's and it's the right mix, you know, because if it's if it's overboard, especially at his size, I mean, how he plays, it could he could easily take some guys out. So he has the right mix. His mental approach is right on point. And I mean, heck, I mean, what he's done, 30 and 16 in those four games in the NCAA tournament. I mean, the most dominant player I've seen, and I don't know how far you have to go back to say, oh yeah, you know, this was a comparable force in college basketball. Right, been a long I haven't time. seen anyone. So if you're believing in that mindset, then this to me would be the perfect matchup for Edie if he matches up against DJ Burns, who's become one of the stars of this NCAA tournament, because Burns is getting all this love about his game and the way he plays and the joy in which he plays and that he's so unique. If you believe that Edie is feeding off all this criticism and people maybe not giving him the credit that he deserves, then this has to be the perfect setup for the big fella. Well, this will be a fun it'll, – it'll be a really fun matchup. I mean, it, North Carolina State plays through through Burns, and, and he's, a, he's a different pl- type of player, kind of like a Zach Randolph, you know, big body, great footwork, incredibly soft That's a good comparison, around, Zach around, Randolph. Uh, uh, around the rim. He, he is a fun player to watch, and he does play with a joy, and, and it's very different from Zach Eady uh, of his focus, his game face. I don't know if it ever leaves him, and heck – if I'm Coach Painter, I, I don't care. Now I'll say, as, as much fun as I've had watching DJ Burns run through the ACC tournament, continue dominance through the NCAA tournament, I just I don't know if this is a fair fight for him. I, I think this game for Purdue, I think it, nor, Purdue's a really difficult matchup for NC State. I don't think they're going to be able to play through Burns. It'll be interesting. We'll see if he can have some success against a 7'4", 300-pound Edie. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think that Kevin Keats, the NC State coach, is smart enough to realize that. And smart enough to realize that he has really good athletic guards. And if there's anything that Purdue has struggled with sometimes, it's athletic guards that can get to the rack and also can really test guys defensively. What can Fletcher Lawyer do defensively if, for example, they get DJ Horn set up on Fletcher Lawyer? If I'm NC State, I think I'm focused more on my athletic guards and maybe what they can provide against Purdue's defense. I would agree. And you look at their guards, Horn, Morsell, those are fifth-year guys. O'Connell's a fourth-year guy. This is a very experienced team. They're kind of on this magical run. And can they continue it? You know, we'll see if they do. I think for NC State, they're going to try to increase the pressure, get deflections. I think dig down on Zach Eady. DR is a really big athletic guy that can move, that can guard a lot of, a lot of different positions. I think you'll, maybe they'll, they'll try to trap on Zach Eady. It's always interesting to see what do teams do to try to contend with Eady. But I would say – on the other end, when I look at Purdue's guards, Fletcher Lawyer, you know, he shot the ball decent, but he's going to the basket. He's putting pressure on defenses. And then Brain Smith, almost 10 points, 10 assists in the NCAA tournament. As good as Zach Eady is, I would almost argue that Brain Smith is the most important player for Purdue. I disagree. <laughs> well, okay. Um, but, it, you know, in terms of how he's playing, how he's running the show, if they don't have him, they're in a world of trouble. And, and yeah, of course, Eady's the most valuable player, their most important piece. But, Smith is easy A2. A A2 oh, without Purdue. question. I don't disagree strongly, by the way. <laughs> and allow me to dream here. We've got about 90 seconds because Purdue's a massive favorite on one side of the bracket. UConn's a massive favorite on the other side of the bracket. How good would it be if we see strength versus strength, UConn, Purdue, their big fella Klingon against Edie. Now, the big advantage to me, if that happens, Klingon plays about 22 minutes a game because that's all he can go. Edie goes the route. Well, that's what everyone would love to see, the two best teams. You don't always everyone get that in college it. basketball. You have the story of the repeating for UConn and the story of redemption for Purdue would be incredible storylines, the two best teams, and to see two, you know, what I think maybe two lottery picks going at it underneath the basket. That's not really the case in today's modern game of basketball, but they're showing, hey, you can do it through bigs. I think Edie definitely has the upper edge, but Klingon, man, did he look good against the Illini. Of course, UConn has to get past Alabama first. I see no issues there for the Huskies, do you? Well, the only thing I'd say is Alabama shoots a ton of threes. Almost half their shots are threes. They shoot it really well. Mark Sears is a point guard. is, is a He's phenomenal terrific. player. His splits are like 50, uh, 50, you know, 50, 40, 90. They're, they're that good. So if they're shooting the heck out of the ball, if they make 20 threes, they made 19, yeah. I think, against Purdue, they could give them a run. But I think we're setting up for a great matchup in the championship game, UConn and Purdue. It would be phenomenal. Nate Oates, really good coach, and they just paid him like he is a really good coach. Now one of the highest paid coaches in all of college basketball. So many fascinating stories. Kevin Keats was potentially on the hot seat. Now he's in the final four.
an uncharacteristically but understandably emotional Robbie Hummel after his alma mater makes it to the Final Four. And we are joined now by the Purdue legend, one of the best college basketball analysts in the business. Robbie, I know, listen, I, I know you well enough to know that is not typically you at the end of any game, whether it's a Purdue game or not. But the emotions did start to flow. You have a great relationship with Coach Painter, with this program. Take us back to that moment and what it was like for you and probably for anyone who's worn the black and gold. Well, first of all, it was a heck of a game. You know, Tennessee was really good, and Zach Eady and Purdue were just a little bit better. Uh, I, th I thought it was an iconic performance by Eady to go for 40 and 16, especially when Dalton Connect is doing what he was doing. And Lance Jones did a good job of making it tough on him at the end of the game. But, um, you know, I, I would have never thought that I would respond in that way. And, look, I, I've wanted Purdue to go to the Final Four forever, and certainly with our group and, and the way that my knee situation unfolded in late February, that kind of took that opportunity from us for a team that was going to be a one seed. Um, so th there's that kind of scar tissue that probably played a part into it. But I, I do blame Elliot Bloom, the Dobo, and Paul <laughs> Lusk, one of the assistants who recruited me for – they softened me up by coming over to the table – um after the game and, and i think we might have been in commercial break or maybe kevin coogler was just reading through the stats or, or doing what he does you know those play-by-play -play guys in radio have got to be beasts They're, they've got to be on it and, and really talk the majority of the time so those two guys came over and, and gave me a big hug and and we you know had a special moment with with those two guys and then when coach painter came over man he i, I was just i'm so happy for him because he deserves this He's one of the the good guys in college basketball. Um, he's done so much for me. He's done so much for his former players. He's one of the best X's and O's coaches in all of college basketball. And, you know, he was saying incredibly nice things about myself and, and Jawan Johnson and Etuan Moore and kind of the foundation uh, is what he he kind of said, you know, so that that – that was hard to hear. And then, you know, I just, I, I'm so proud of him and I'm so proud of the players because I know what they've been through and I know how hard it's been since the FDU game last season. And, and then also you take in the two, the two years prior with St. Peter's and North Texas and to see these guys really rally from that and stay the course and, and, and work hard and do it the right way and get over the hump against a really good Tennessee team. It, it was just a very emotional day. And, you know, I just I think it says a lot about how many former players have, whether it's on Twitter or whether they, they drove to the game and you see Ryan Smith in tears and you see Dakota Mathias, same thing. Everybody was so happy for this group and, and for coach and, and his staff because they deserve it. When the Midwestern cowboy can cry, anybody can cry. Uh, any truth to the rumor <laughs> that that was the first time that you've shed a tear since you were on a shortened Minnesota Timberwolves bench and asked to play the five against DeMarcus Cousins? <laughs> and, and bring the ball up and play point guard on offense. Yes, that that would make any man cry who paid for tickets, um, and including me, who has to, to do both of those things. All right, Robbie, let's get down to brass tacks as Purdue gets set to the Final Four in the matchup against NC State. We know about what Zach Eady has done, but on the NC State side, kind of the darling of this tournament has not just been the Cinderella team, but their big guy, DJ Burns. This is a fascinating matchup because Burns, like most other bigs, has never seen a player like Zach Eady in terms of his size, his skill set, but also his ability to stay on the floor for nearly 40 minutes, which obviously Burns right. doesn't have. When you look at that matchup, what kind of jumps out at you? Well, I'm intrigued by how Purdue guards it. You know, the, the kind of obvious answer, I think, is, well, Edie will just guard him. But for a lot of these teams, especially with fours that don't shoot the ball all that well, and I think DR, Muhammad Diara kind of fits that bill. He's an athlete. He's a rebounder. He shoots, I think, a decent percentage from three. I want to say it's, yeah, shoots 33% from three, but it's not on, on that high a volume. I could see Purdue starting Edie, Edie on Diara and then going with their four, Trey Kaufman, Wren, to start on Burns, and then Edie will just kind of play like a rover, and I just and he'll come over and double team, and they'll double the post and then rotate out, knowing that DR is not going to kill you from from three. Um, that will be a choice that they're going to have to make because Burns, he, he wheels and deals. He's got a really good left-hand jump hook. He can really pass. So I, I could see them doing it. NC State has been an incredible story you know to win five games in five days at the ACC tournament and then you end up 
winning four games in the NCAAs. That, that, that says a lot about how much this team has come together. You know, you read up on them. They, they've stuck through some tough times. They, they've really done a nice job of, of handling some of the little things that they said they weren't doing earlier in the year. But on top of all that stuff, they're shooting the ball way better and they're defending way better. And, and when you do that, good things are going to happen. But Burns is really, he's been the, the story of the tournament for them. You know, he's, he looks like an NFL D lineman. And you know what? That might be in his future because of the way that his footwork is, his size, um, he, he's, he's definitely going to have a choice to make whenever that, that day comes that basketball ends for him. But man, he, he was phenomenal against Duke and NC state is really a great story. I, I think the biggest thing for me though, Rick is how, how does Purdue decide to guard him? And also how does NC state try to deal with Edie? I loved Matt Painter last week, Robbie. He was asked by someone about the criticism of Zach Eady that he's only good because he's big and, and paint went on a little bit of a rant, basically said anybody who says yeah. that is a moron. They're, they're idiotic. They should have to take a test to prove their basketball knowledge. When you watch Zach Eady, what jumps out to you? You take away the seven foot four. What else about him makes him the best player that we've seen in college basketball in a very long time? Well, it starts with the understanding that I've played with a lot of seven foot guys that suck. <laughs> so it starts right there where Honesty. just because you're tall, doesn't mean that you're productive. And I've played with a lot of seven footers that don't really like basketball that much either. Um, the first thing that jumps out for me with Edie has to be the conditioning, the stamina and the athleticism and agility, because the way he moves and some of the plays he makes, you think, man, for a person that is seven foot three or seven foot four, depending on where you look, th it's remarkable. I mean, I, I was watching film on Gonzaga because I, I hadn't seen him this year and they were playing Purdue and we had that game in the Sweet 16 and Gonzaga was playing a, a team early on in the season and I was doing like personnel stuff. So when you go through some of the clips, of the guys that don't play as much, you can get back to that that point in the year. I just like to see what how these guys score, or how they've been successful. And Gonzaga's playing this team and this other this opponent has a seven foot center. And a Gonzaga player drives the baseline. The seven footer leaves his man, and in the most slow fashion I've ever said, I swear to God, it was like watching a glacier move. <laughs> he comes over and stops the ball. The Gonzaga player flips it to a player in the middle of the floor. This guy turns and in like four seconds comes over to contest, jumps up. He's so late to it, lands, and then it takes him like two or three seconds to land, turn, and start going the other way. And I'm like, man, Edie does that in the most fluid way to contest shots all the time. And I was going to tweet it, but then I was like, man, don't, don't dog this poor player. <laughs> don't need to dog him to prove the point. But I just think the way he moves rebounds outside of his area. He played 39 minutes against Tennessee. He's seven, four, 300 pounds. He played 39 minutes. He sat for 30 seconds. So he, from a cardio and a conditioning standpoint, it's off the charts. But then the skill, I mean, he went to his counter a good amount against Tennessee. They, they were started taking away his bread and butter move is his right jump hook. He wants to get to that left shoulder. He did a couple times where he went to that left hook. He did once where he went up and under. He's got post moves and he's got touch. He makes free throws. I think that, you know, a couple of years from now, it wouldn't surprise me to see him be able to knock down jumpers, whether that's from 15 feet or even extending that to three. I, I don't know. He's made a three this year. Um, he's only one for two, but his shot doesn't look bad. You know, he, he has skill and touch. And I'm telling you, Rick, I've seen so many guys that just aren't good that are that big. And he is really good. He is a really, really good player, generational player. He, he belongs. When you hear those stats and they're saying, man, it, the first thing since Shaq, first thing since Patrick Ewing, first thing since Ralph Sampson, Bill Walton, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, man, you don't just get in there because you're big. Those dudes are iconic players, and, and Edie's an iconic player as well. I 100% agree with you. Let's get you out of here on this. All year long, everybody that I talked to had the same answer to this question. I asked, after Zach Eady and Braden Smith, who's the third most important player on this Purdue team? For the entire year, Rayfell Davis, Bruce Weber, everybody else said it's Lance Jones. Without question, it's Lance yeah. Jones. Now, Lance has struggled a little bit offensively as of late. As we go into the Final Four, if I ask you that question today, is the answer still Lance Jones or is it someone else? I think it would ping pong between Lance Jones and Fletcher Lawyer. I thought Fletcher defensively was really good against Tennessee, just active off the basketball, where he needed to be, didn't get beat off the bounce too badly. 
Um, you know, there's so much has been talked about how it's hard for him to stay on the floor if he's not going to make shots. Well, Fletcher's rode this heater in March. Um, going into the Tennessee game, he was 15 of 22 from three in the month of March. So he he certainly upped his level, but I thought his defense really stood out against Tennessee. Um, and just his ability, he, he got to the rim a couple times. That Tennessee defense was so worried about Edie rolling that it opened up in the pick and roll. The guards were able to get downhill. Um, Lance is still a good a good option. I, I know that the, the jump shot maybe hasn't been there. Kugler killed the call. It gave me goosebumps, actually. Lance makes that three with like 2.30 to go. And Cougar's like, oh, the biggest shot of his career. <laughs> uh, it was it was big time. I, I had goosebumps for sure. Um, big time shot. But then also his defense on Connect. You know, they started Braden Smith. They thought maybe Lance needed to guard Zakai Ziegler because he initiated so much offense. And with the way Connect started the game, just kind of elevating over the top of Braden Smith. Not that he wasn't there. It's just Connect 6-7 and could shoot right over the top. Um, connect was on a roll and I, I thought Lance's defense there in the second half, even though connect had 37 or 38 points, I think he took like 29 shots to get there. He, he took a bunch of shots. Um, so I thought his defense was big. Obviously the three is, is just a massive shot. Um, it probably is still Lance Jones, but if you said Fletcher lawyer, I, I wouldn't hate the answer either. Purdue starts the Final Four Saturday against NC State. Tip-off just after 6 o'clock Eastern time. Of course, the game will be played out in the desert. And Robbie Hummel will be there as part of our Big Ten Network Final Four coverage. Robbie, appreciate the time. As always, my friend, safe travels. Look forward to hearing from you this weekend from Glendale. No problem. And I look forward to beating you on the golf course this spring. Not going to happen. <laughs> Transfer portal is open, and it is active. Jake Davis, shooter, played last year at Mercer, has committed to play for Brad Underwood and the Fighting Illini starting next season. You gain some, you lose some, because shortly after that announcement was made, we learned that Dane Danger has entered the transfer portal and plans to play next year somewhere other than Illinois. Back with Trent Meacham, this is the world we live in. This is not going to end anytime soon. How do you think coaches now approach the transfer portal depending on what their roster looks like and how much they believe in transfers versus the old school high school recruiting philosophy? Well, I think most coaches want to be old and transfers allow you to get old quickly. You can see guys develop that have played and produced at, at a good level and you can see them now do that at your level. I mean, Illinois had great success with three fifth year transfers this year. You look at the final four teams, UConn, Tristan Newton, one of their best players is a transfer. Obviously with Purdue, Lance Jones was a key pickup. Their only transfer, NC State, Alabama, two of their final four teams, all of their best players virtually are from the transfer portal. What I would maybe like to see, Rick, though, when I, when I look back at my uh, professional career in Europe, most guys that play professionally outside the NBA sign one-year deals. So these European cl- – and, and players are always trying to level up to get paid more, to go to a higher level. So most of these teams have a GM, and they know they sign guys for one year, and maybe you can keep some guys around, maybe you can have some consistency, but guys come and go. They have to reboot their roster almost annually. It's not an easy job to do, but I, I could see maybe some of these colleges – you know, in conjunction with their head coach, having a GM-type guy wow. that can re- scout, recruit, and be better positioned during the course of the season. These coaches don't want to recruit during the season. Do you think, do you think though, that that would be good for college basketball? I mean, then we lose all of the fundamental beliefs about recruiting, development, the things that I think, and I know I'm old here, have made college basketball great. Well, I I think it could help. It just put things – it would be easier for coaches so they could focus more on development. And it would be conjunction with development, with recruiting, with, you know, giving them all the resources that players want. But, you know, and it's still – it's recruiting. You want to bring guys in that fit your system, that you can develop so they can reach their goals. NIL shouldn't be the ultimate goal for everybody. But if they can capitalize on it during that short time, hey, I'm not mad at them. You're not out there headhunting for yourself for a job, are you? I'm not. I think we need you here for a little while longer. I don't want those problems. You know, we got a few more days in basketball season. For Trent Meacham and Shimmy Gray-Miller, I'm Rick Pizzo. As always, we appreciate the hang on this edition of Big Ten Today.